There's a lot of you here. What's up, lads and lasses? I made a bet with my son that I wouldn't say that, so I just, I just won the bet. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's back there somewhere, I can't see him. Um, I'm extremely honored uh, to do this, as you might get guess, um, again. Um, and I'm also nervous, again. I'm actually more nervous um, than the first time, so um, getting ready to, to lay this out for you. Um, but the nice thing about doing a last lecture a second time is you get to fix all your mistakes and add the things that you forgot to say. So I, I've done that today, and if anybody saw the last time I did this about four or five years ago, um, I, I guarantee you I've changed a few things. Um, guess what? We continue to learn. So this mostly, more than anything, is about uh, people that have been around me and things that matter. Um, and uh, it's really a four-part lecture. Um, and the last time I, I, I did it is the good, the bad, and the ugly, but this time I've changed it around. I've gone the ugly, the bad, and the good, and that's so I don't have any suicide attempts at the end of the lecture. Um, um, uh, but I do start uh, with a similar question, right? Uh, and, and that is how an aspiring rock musician, um, goofy Canadian, um, and errant club go goer of Boston um, and cruise ship musician. You're going to learn a lot about my sordid history here. Um, <coughs> that is not my band. Um, how do those people become this? Right? How do I get here? Holy cow. Um, and you'll notice me getting ready to clock Tony just in case he misbehaves. <laughs> and and uh, he, he doesn't know it. And I'm really unhappy he's, he's not here today. I just want him to know that I'm watching him every second. Um, I won't have the mace. Professor Krimi will. She's up there somewhere. Um, and so, Krimi, this is on you. You make sure. OK, good. That's great. Um, uh, and another part of this story actually involves my long-suffering wife, Mary, um, and, uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm not going to talk about that story because you'd be here for a very long time. Um, so I'm going to actually start with, with the tough news. I'm going to talk about uh, the hard things. And, and the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is something that is ugly, um, and it's called the big sort. And so back in the 1990s, uh, this is a timeline starting in the 60s all the way to 2010. Um, back in the 1990s, this guy named Bob Putnam uh, started noticing some things about America. And as it turns out, he was also noticing things about Canadians and Europeans and a whole bunch of folks in advanced industries, in industrialized democracies. And uh, he noticed that people were losing trust in government. Back in the 1960s, we were up around 75%. It had been that way for a really long time. Um, and it dropped like a stone. And people in my American politics class have seen this slide before. Uh, and at the same time, distrust in government was growing enormously and is at the highest levels we've ever seen. This is through the Bush and Obama and Trump years. Um, and Putnam noticed, he called it bowling alone. Americans had all bowled before. It was the most popular sport through the 20th century. And instead of bowling together in teams with their community, suddenly they were bowling alone, right? We had fragmented. And he tells an amazing story about how America has lost its core. It's lost something that we call social capital, the bonds that bring us together. Right? Uh, and that's a little bit of a scary story. It's not the same place that it was in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Um, and this other guy named Bill Bishop um, noticed something else, and he called it the big sort. Uh, and what you're looking at here is in the areas that are brown or, or black, those are counties that are absolutely no way a Democrat's going to win or a Republican's going to win. The only counties, and this is from 20, 2004, and it's the, basically the same now. As a matter of fact, it's worse. Um, the counties that, that are white are the only ones with enough of a mix of Democrats and Republicans to actually make them competitive. Right? And we know this, if we take a look at census data, we know that liberals in Austin, Texas go live with other liberals 
who are moderately income, mostly white, and they live in this certain census tract, right? And so Bill Bishops told a story um, about how people were self-sorting themselves into areas in America where everyone else looked just like them. Um, and we're seeing this in our politics, right? Back in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s and the 60s, America looked like a big bell curve, right? And you can see in 20 years, we are now moving into two camps, right? This is America, less purple, more red and blue, right? Um, and so the one thing that I'll disagree with with Brian Helmbuck is we are not reading the same news. We are not seeing the same information. We are living different sorted lives. Um, and this is reflected in our political leaders. Um, this is voting similarity networks. It's a fancy thing that political scientists do, right? And you can take a look back again in the 1990s, the 1980s, the 1970s. Senators in our, pol in our political system, they worked together to create bipartisan legislation designed to lead us. We don't do that anymore. I'm not sure if I can get this to work. There we go, right? There's this sparse area now in the aughts, in the years of your generation, where our politicians are working together, right? That's not good for democracy. Um, so uh, this sort continues. And apologies to anybody from my public policy class who saw this lecture about two weeks ago. I, I test, test drove it. Um, uh, we're seeing this in terms of income. We are sorting ourselves in terms of income. About 80% of America right now has not received a raise once you account for inf inflation since 1971. That is not the American dream, right? So we're splitting out in terms of income inequality. Um, <coughs> And uh, we're seeing it, of course, uh, in our political culture. <laughs> and, and this is how we see each other, right? And these two icons are kind of funny, making fun of uh, right-wingers with their guns and making fun of those granola-eating hippies, right? Um, and so we can be humorous about that, but actually right now the problem is, is our politics and who we are, this sort is occurring, we're starting to see each other as aliens. We don't trust each other, we're intolerant of the other side, right? Um, this is not a positive um, challenge. And we're seeing it in a whole host of other areas. We're seeing it in terms of gender, we're seeing it in terms of religion, we're seeing it in terms of culture and race and class. Right? We're losing that ability to have conversations with people who are different than us. And this is in part, right? a lot of this started before, uh, but in part because we have a new world. This is your world, and it's amazing. This is the biggest revolution in information history. It is an information revolution. It is a digital revolution. These devices change everything and the whole system that backs them up. And there's a lot of good that come, can come from these things. But there's a lot of challenge that comes from these things as well. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we're starting to see is something we call the daily me, right? Where people are picking and choosing the information they see. We no longer have a common set of ideas that bind us. We don't have a common set of information that binds us. And this is really disturbing, right? How do we move forward as a country? It's always been tough to move forward in this country, right? But the thing that's moved us forward is when we have some kind of ideal, some set of information that brings us together, right? And we're losing that ability. Um, so this brings us, this giant experiment, this challenge uh, uh, has some bad permutations. And one of the things uh, that I worry a lot about uh, is this. This is the bad, right? Uh, we can't have a conversation about this in this country, right? Every other country in the world is serious about dealing with this problem, at least to some degree, right? And we are still having an argument about whether it exists or not, because our interests in the two teams that we're on are so different, right? In response to these kinds of problems used to be something that Republicans paid a lot of attention to. As a matter of fact, a lot of policies 
that address these kinds of problems were brought to us by Republicans. We've lost the ability to have that conversation now. Um, and this is going to have huge costs that your generation will pay for the next hundred years, right? And we're paying those costs now. We're paying those costs in terms of storms, in terms of impacts everywhere across the United States and the globe. This is a global problem. Um, we have the ability to solve it, or at least to address it and mitigate it and reduce it, but we need to be able to have a conversation. The second big challenge is the decline in democracy that is occurring everywhere in the world. Um, we are now 12 straight years, so political scientists follow this. We rate countries uh, according to democracy and civil rights, freedom of speech, transparency, knowing how your government is spending your money. And in every country around the world, including the United States, we are seeing declines in the way political scientists rate democracy. Right? Our leaders won't do what we tell, it, we tell them to do unless we tell them to do it. So we have a responsibility to make sure, and these reductions, the increase in executive power is occurring under both Democrats and conservatives. I'm not playing a partisan game here. Right? Executive power increased under Obama, as it did under Bush and Clinton and Trump. <clears throat> so we have a necessity to speak out to make sure our government is doing the will of the people and not the will of some people. Um, regardless of what your beliefs are, being able to stand up for them and getting information from the government that serves you is a critical request. If you sit there and do nothing, they will do what they want. Right? They are our leaders. We vote for them, but only if we take part. Um, the lack of dialogue in the United States and everywhere in the world creates the kind of problems that are seen in a, a slide I did use to repeat from last time. This is Marty Richards. And uh, he was blown up in the Boston Marathon bombing. And he lived just, I don't know, about three quarters of a mile of, from us in Dorchester. Um, went to the school down the road from my son's school, right? Um, this kind of hatred is what happens when people can't talk to each other. This is one kind of hatred, but I'm not here to talk about religious extremism, right? That hatred we see in a wide variety of different contexts around the world. Um, and so, <clears throat> We can do better than what happened to Marty, eight-year-old child. So I want to switch the mood a little bit, and I want to come to some of the good news. And, and there is really good news. Um, a quick clarification, there is only one place in which a lack of dialogue is perfectly OK, and that's uh, between the Red Sox and the Yankees. Uh, <laughs> just want to clarify that. Um, <coughs> I'm a Canadian, but when I went to Boston, uh, apparently it got into my bloodstream. Um, and, and now I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Canada, because I had an experience. I was, I was up in Canada a lot last year on a sabbatical, and, uh, and I was up there for a conference two weeks ago. This is Justin Trudeau. He's the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, I am not here on a Justin Trudeau cheerleading session. He's kind of annoying. He's way too handsome. Um, uh, uh, but this is him during a session on indigenous reconciliation. Canada has a huge amount of indigenous peoples and Indians. Uh, it is embarking right now on a massive uh, engagement with the indigenous peoples of that country, which the government of Canada treated very poorly. Right? And it resulted in rapes and disappeared people and children being put into uh, schools, taken away from their parents. Um, kind of horrible. And Canada right now is trying to do better. I don't know if they will do better. There's lots of disagreement there. But this represents dialogue. Right? And there is similarly, uh, at the conference I was at, it was an energy conference, and Canada right now is putting up a uh, pipeline. 
And there's a lot of disagreement, just like here, about this pipeline on the west coast. It's covering a lot of indigenous lands. And the protesters managed to sneak into the conference while the Minister of Energy was speaking. Uh, his name's Jim Carr. And Jim Carr uh, is sitting here, and posters came, and protesters came down, and they unrolled big banners, and a native Haida elder, a woman of about 70 or 75 years old, came up to the front and started ranting and talking to the audience just like this. And Minister Carr, this is the Minister of en Energy, there's a bunch of security people over there, held them off, and he stepped back and he did this. And he did that for seven minutes while she spoke. This is the Minister of Energy stepping back, not speaking, holding off security. He listened. He listened to what the protesters had to say. They won't come to an agreement anytime soon. They're trying. But that represents dialogue. That represents some degree of attempt at trying to resolve differences. Right? That's what we need going forward. That's what you guys need to do. I said you guys. <laughs> um, and the last little story in this, um, similarly, the very same day of that energy conference, a Toronto police officer encountered the mad terrorist who drove a van into 25 people on a Toronto sidewalk. I don't know if you people saw this in the news, right? He, he was a crazy guy, a psychopath who hated women um, and felt that women had given him the wrong, done wrong by him, and so he killed a bunch of people. And this police officer faced with a person who was probably carrying a gun by themselves, this happened to be caught on closed circuit television, sat there, stood their ground, and did nothing. Told them to put the weapon down over and over and over again for five minutes. Exercised restraint, exercised tolerance, and they were able to arrest the person ultimately uh, without anyone getting shot. This is the kind of tolerance and exercise and restraint that we need to engage in in the digital world. So those are some examples of doing better. Um, uh, and to be clear, Canadians screw up lots of stuff too. Just go to my class. Um, the other good news is reasons to be cheerful, and I'm going to whip through these. Uh, you don't need to see the details. Um, there is good news out there. There are trends about how we can do better as human beings globally, and there are lots of them. Infant mortality rates how early infants die and how many of them, dropping like a stone over hundreds of years, poverty is, excuse me, air quality in developed nations, dropping, right? We're no longer dying of emphysema to the same degree that we did in the United States. Poverty is dropping. Child labor, dropping. War is occurring and there's less death. These are all long-term trends, they're global, they're in the United States, and they're around the world. This is all good news, and this is because human beings can and must and will do better, even when they face big challenges. And life expectancy is increasing, and literacy rates are going through the roof over the last 500 years. We are doing better, and that's the good news, right? Um, but it's taken work. Um, and despite the recent 12-year hiccup, democracy is actually increasing. Uh, up over the last 20 years, over the 50% mark. Now 50% of countries in the world are functioning democracies to some degree. So I don't want to have us forget with the big challenges that you have about the capacity of human beings to improve the world. The other last part four, I call this happy. I've been teaching a class uh, about happiness in uh, my Clarkson seminar, uh, and there's a reason that the founders of the Constitution in the United States used the term life, liberty, and happiness. 
They did not use the term liberty and high-level income, right? And as it turns out, there's a, a reason for this. There's an enormous amount of research on happiness. Um, there's a journal of happiness studies, who knew? Um, and one of the things we know is there's something called the happiness plateau, right? We know money brings happiness if you need to put a roof over your head or food on your table or you want to have a job, any of that stuff, right? But after approximately about $79,000 in the United States, making more money is not going to make you more happy. If it's 150,000, if it's 250,000, if it's 800,000, if it's a million, if you're Bill Gates with a few billion dollars, it's not going to make you happier, right? Statistically, you have just a, the same amount of chances you have if you make about $80,000, right? So you don't want to be poor, right? But that money's not going to help. So <clears throat> the things that will help you, and this is backed up, experiences. Go ride an elephant. Go travel the world with your friends. It doesn't, you don't have to ride an elephant. Go do things, experience them. Get yourself out of your comfort zone. Go hike the, the Himalayas. Um, that's me in 1989. Um, connect with people, even the crazy cab drivers. <laughs> um, and it might be a little hard to see, but that's actually my leg sticking out of the window. <laughs> Uh, this was my part-time job in, in college, uh, and the first year I was out of college. Uh, being a cab driver is um, kind of an amazing gig. It, uh, it gets you to meet every single possible kind of person you could imagine. Um, and that was an amazing experience for me. It taught me how to deal with people. Learn how to deal with those people who are not the same as you. Figure them out. The other things, uh, and, and by the way, Doing that will make you happy. Um, when you work and you put a lot of effort into something, you get big goals and it will make you happy. Just ask the NCAA champions for the second time running. Nice one, Clarks. Um, uh, art and music, those are the things that are going to make you happy, not a million dollars. Um, and believe it or not, education. And Clarkson, in, in three days, you're going to walk there, and I'm so sorry, but one of those people with a giant pig bladder is going to be screeching in front of you. Um, <coughs> it's a terrible thing. Um, but Clarkson's not the only school that does this. This is actually Harvard's. Um, I went back to school at the age of 35, um, and it was my opportunity. Thanks, Gasper. Um, and, uh, and it changed my life and made me a very happy person right now. You gotta have the people, giving to people. When I come to Clarkson, I spend a lot of time giving to you, my students, my colleagues, doing work here. It is amazing. It makes me an incredibly happy person. So thank you uh, to all of you. Um, that's so important. And your goofy friends, get out there with them, do stuff with them, get outdoors. That's what's going to make you happy. Not a million dollars. Um, just whatever you do, do not climb with Gollum. Um, negative people, like that one, can poison your life. Um, and of course, the most important thing is your family. Um, mine I love very much. and, and uh, very, very happy that they continue to put up with me. Uh, and for every student in every class of mine, you know the last two things that are coming up here, um, poutine and beer. Um, make, sure, make sure you do your proper Canadian consumption. If there's one thing you've learned here at Clarkson, you need to do that. And lastly, find a special place. This is mine. It's Fairfield Pond in northern Vermont. Everybody has one a place they go that makes them happy, that gives them a place to rest their soul. Um, so in all of this, uh, we have lots of work to do. There are big challenges. There are big problems. But I know you guys are up to the challenge. Um, and there is also hope and possibility and love 
maybe even if you marry a bass player, <laughs> perhaps. Um, so thank you. Go out there, find your special place, do good. Thank you very much.